Teotihuacan, a site we have covered many times here upon our channel. Most recently, we discussed the impressive amount of electrical material found within the numerous pyramids that dot the site, known as mica, a notorious modern-day electrical insulator that's physical origins were found to have been from a quarry over 3,200 kilometers away within Brazil. When Spanish explorers first visited the area, they asked the Aztecs who built these marvelous buildings. The Aztecs replied that it was the Quina Metzen, a quote, race of giants who came from the heavens in the time of the second sun. It is clearly a site of tremendous importance regarding lost knowledge here upon our planet. Knowledge which could have been left within our very distant past. And now, an eight-year project has discovered a secret tunnel beneath the third largest pyramid within the area. A tunnel which archaeologists suspect will lead to a royal tomb. Discovered in 2003 with the use of robotic technology, similar to the technology used to discover the secret chamber within the Great Pyramid of Khufu, rumored to also be that of a royal tomb. Littered with artifacts which have remained untouched for untold millennia, now thought to be over 50,000 separate items, shedding light onto the life of those who built this amazing place, not only reveal who they actually were, but explain their religious beliefs, their technical prowess, and indeed how they built them, but most importantly, for what purpose. Upon exploring the tunnel, archaeologists have discovered an enormous pool of liquid mercury, and supposedly, it is a massive quantity filling a mysterious basin at the end of the tunnel. Could a king's tomb or ritual chamber possibly lay far below this pool of mysterious mercury? Mexican researcher Sergio Gomez has somehow been allowed to release all of these amazing discoveries, found beneath the pyramid of the feathered serpent publicly, receiving little academic resistance since. Mercury is toxic and capable of devastating the human body through prolonged exposure. Academia perceived mercury as having no practical purpose within ancient Mesoamerica. But interestingly, it has been discovered at other sites. Rosemary Joyce, a professor of anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, said that archaeologists have found mercury at three other sites around Central America, not to mention our own research into Oak Island, which has also held a legend of liquid mercury for many years. Its presence in Teotihuacan is undoubtedly perplexing and intriguing. Gomez speculated that the mercury could be a sign that his team is close to uncovering the first royal tomb ever found in Teotihuacan. The mercury may have symbolized an underworld river or lake, Gomez postulated, an idea that resonated with Annabeth Hedrick, a professor at the University of Denver and the author of works on Teotihuacan and Mesoamerican art. Quote, the shimmering reflective qualities of liquid mercury may have resembled an underworld river, not that different from the river Styx. Hedrick continues, if only in the concept that it's the entrance to the supernatural world and the entrance to the underworld. End quote. Not only did the people of Mesoamerica clearly figure out how to create or derive liquid mercury from mercury ore, they also knew of deep underground water systems and lakes that could be accessed through caves. Rosemary Joyce said the ancient Mesoamericans could produce liquid mercury by heating mercury ore, known as cinnabar, which they also used for its blood-red pigment. Yet, just how these ancient people managed to figure all these amazing things out remains a mystery. We may indeed be on the precipice of one of the most important discoveries of our modern age. We will keep you posted. When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that, to modern man, escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. 
ancient sites such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left, which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines. These particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stone cutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena, and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, for example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round bottom vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take, especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations, preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians but further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them. Many ancient sites found all over the world can no longer be explained away with currently attested academic opinion. Who they say built them, why, or when they were created. The most popular of these anomalies are the ancient monuments that can be found upon the Giza Plateau currently explained as having been built by our copper tool-wielding ancestors a mere 4,000 years ago, somehow successfully creating some of the most precisely built and indeed enormous ancient structures found on Earth, decidedly choosing to use granite blocks many tons in weight as their building material of choice. Ironically, although these sites are somehow exclaimed as having been built by the ancient Egyptians, 
Any actual, literal explanation of how this was actually done has never been provided. Not only is academic opinion severely lacking any logical understandings as to the construction of these sites, they seemingly attempt to ignore, and in some cases conceal, additional controversial anomalies they simply cannot understand. Enormous stone megaliths are hidden all over Giza, and especially around the base of the Great Pyramids. And not only were these buildings adorned with incredibly hard granite, but also basalt, a similarly tough stone, and another which would be near impossible to have hewn with mere copper implements. Known as Giza's basalt floor, it is what many people now see as the smoking gun for evidence of advanced engineering having once been responsible for the construction of the site. Amongst the remaining fragments of the basalt floor is overwhelming evidence of ancient machinery, telltale precision signatures left on many stones, suggesting high technology was responsible for the shaping of Giza's enormous stones. Cut marks that could only have been left by high-speed disc cutting, striations, precise ridges and countless other curious features have been thankfully left upon these stones, and these surviving tool marks could one day be used to actually identify the technology once used to build the site. We now feel that the evidence to suggest that the modern attested and mass-published theories regarding the origins of the Giza Plateau, its age, and indeed its creator's past capabilities, is currently incorrect and is now overwhelming. And that it is only a matter of time before a revival of this past knowledge and indeed understandings again begins to flourish. We recently made a community post pertaining to the remarkable yet little-known or indeed studied discovery made within the extremely ancient city of Petara in modern-day Turkey. And due to popular demand, we are going to cover this peculiar artifact in greater depth. As mentioned, although there are many archaeological sites within Turkey, and particularly within this region, this peculiar feature is rarely discussed within modern academic or archaeological circles, and once you realize what this enormous relic might have once been, you may realize why. Known as the ancient aqueduct of Patera, it was once a series of tubular systems hewn from solid sandstone, presumably running from settlement to settlement. Some parts clearly displaying a significant level of erosion, indicating a truly colossal antiquity that has, unfortunately, made reconstruction of some of the pipes quite difficult. Claimed to be that of the Romans, used for transportation of water, however, what is interesting regarding Patera, and indeed many other ancient sites claimed by the Romans as their own constructions, is that it too holds some unexplainable features, things that separate it from the other, more standard Roman architecture. It seems for many ancient, highly eroded sites found around our world, the culprit for construction is often put upon the most convenient candidate, completely absent of any explanation regarding construction. In 1993, a monumental pillar was discovered at Patera, on which is a Greek dedication to Claudius and an official announcement of the building of roads by the governor, Quintus Veranius Nepos, in giving place names and distances, essentially an entire public itinerary, yet alas, they forgot to mention the enormous undertaking that was the aqueduct. One has to wonder, where did the Romans get all their ingenious ideas? Were they all originals? Or perhaps, as we have posited in the past, akin to the ancient Egyptians, had some helpful head starts from a once far more capable, far more knowledgeable people who left structures still standing to this day? The little research that we have unearthed regarding the original site does indeed indicate that Patera's ancient piping system is in fact not Roman, but the origin of the Romans' inspiration when it came to the creation of their own piping systems. Even the original settlement and building of Patera was attributed to and named after Patera, son of Apollo, a great deity, a mythical figure. It pertains to a first, highly eroded, perplexing stretch of 5.4 kilometers along the steep western slope of Kisla Mountain, down to the community of Akbel, 
Details from RomanAqueducts.com. Regarding the research is as follows, quote, It originally consisted of a masonry channel, presumably of Hellenistic age, of which only scant relics remain. This stretch was later replaced, probably by the Romans, by a single line of 55 to 58 centimeter long ceramic pipes. The pipeline was laid directly on the ground, alongside the abandoned channel, and locally positioned on low rocks or in cut rocks." End quote. Are we looking at a far more ancient, far more advanced relic than one is first led to believe? A relic later replicated to a certain degree by the Romans for their own ends. We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling.